Yes. Well, I turned myself into a talking shark at one point, which was very wow. cool. I've tried to use the, you know, the Zoom backgrounds and stuff. And my computer always yells at me for being too old. Yeah. It's, yeah. It says that I don't have the power. <laughs> There was this weird thing that happened at the beginning of quarantine where I suddenly saw all these opportunities to just drop into people's conversations. And I loved it. I was like, uh, I, you know, I'm, I normally struggle to do, to like participate in social conversations because I'm like, I'm very introverted, but this was, I find it less emotionally taxing in, yeah. in the virtual space. So yeah. I, I, saw all these things and I would just drop in and then I would have conversations with a bunch of random people, you know, <laughs> like our, our interests or our backgrounds or whatever didn't align. And I was like, this is fantastic. And then <laughs> I've been having these conversations lately where what has ended up happening is we've created efficiencies, which mean we're only having those, we're having like a lot of conversations on virtual spaces, but not in the same random kind of way we were initially. Yeah. Um, so we're losing this kind of magic that I saw at the outset of quarantine, which mm -hmm. is the randomness of the interactions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I wonder why that is. I wonder if wonder if people are just getting used to interacting this way, or I wonder what that. I wonder what that. Yeah. About. Yeah, I suspect it's. Um, I don't, it's like whoever is in charge of, you know, saying what opportunities are available to us, like during our workday, for example, yeah. they're, they're motivated to create efficiencies, right? So they're going to say here, you know, they're going to line up as many opportunities that align with their goals as possible for yeah. you. And yeah. those are all of you people in this category, you're going to be meeting in this space at this time. And, you know, and so there are. I think fewer and fewer people, fewer people have bandwidth to create the random opportunities. Yeah. It was like, um, it was weird. It was just, I, I kept seeing these things pop up that were like, I need social contact right now. So here's this, I'm just doing a happy hour or I'm, you know, we're just going to have a conversation and I don't know what the subject is going to be. Yeah. And I see fewer and fewer of those. And that was where, you know, nowadays, most of, most of the, meetings are like categorized they're um you know they are intended to serve the purposes of whatever the system you're you are within mm -hmm. and they're not human driven which yeah. i feel like the the value of those random interactions is is that they're the the entire value being sought there is is human centered not system centered so. Well, and also just a divergence of ideas, right? If yeah. Meetings that are run for efficiency are really run for the convergence of ideas. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we know about problem solving and, and dialogue and, and real collaboration is about building a structure where divergence can enter the conversation. And, and you have a mission for that divergence. I think that's why I love design thinking so much as a way, as a, as a social technology to bring people together is that divergence is built into the structure of design thinking. Um, and it yeah. gives people permission um, to engage in that kind of dialogue because again because you're right so much of that conversation is around convergence and driving out diversity yeah yeah i um this is something i keep having to to like harp on for people who are trying to build innovation strategies is that you can't build you can't build an innovation strategy in the same way that you would build like a pipeline for a factory, you know, um, because a lot of the necessary processes are they're they're like 
necessarily inefficient. There are inefficiencies that have to be built into the process, right? Um, and you can't get around that. And divergence is an example of that. You know, yeah, it's like the the ultimate. I think the ultimate like expression of what that is. It's that. Um, it's it's the need to be surprised by what happens. And yeah. if you're creating a system that's efficient, you don't want to be surprised by what right. happens. Right. Um, so or I think I feel like I should introduce you. Uh, to, you know, <laughs> I, I ended up getting to minute 10 last time for the previous episode that I did with uh, um, with Ben and Nate from JSAO um, before I introduced them and said what we were even talking about, which I think is OK, you know, yeah. Um the threshold for entry for this particular podcast is that you kind of already have an interest or that you're curious enough to keep going and fig figure out what we're even on about. Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, I think I warned you it's very unstructured. Um, and largely, <laughs> yeah, it's largely, um, so this is in the weeds, uh, with Agitare and the, um, the primary purpose of this is, um, to just try and take a conversational walk through concepts of design and discovery, just to get new viewpoints into the, into the minds of the people who are on this journey of discovery for, for discovery and facilitation exercises, um, with the Agitari community. So we have a built-in audience for it. We're not, we're not doing the standard podcast thing where it's like maximize your audience. We, we have a built-in audience who are already on this journey. And part of what they need, in my opinion, is just to hear a lot of voices on the subject, right? And to hear a lot of perspectives. Um, and a unstructured conversation, I think, does that in a lot of ways, in a better way than... Um, in better ways than like these structured, like a curriculum would. And that uh, you are Karen Pettyhold, and you are the director of Design Thinking DC. Um, and would you, will you just actually, you know what? I asked you to do home. Did you, did you draw a picture for me? Well, I illustrated a picture. If I can figure out how to share it with you. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me figure out how I share it with you because I, um, I ended up doing like a little mural board in, uh, Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So this is exciting. Just for background, what I've done here, I inspired by what I learned at the, uh, design fundamentals course at the joint special operations university. I asked Karen to, draw me a picture or illustrate in some way her relationship with the field of design, design thinking. And uh, the idea here is that you start with an abstraction. You start with just express yourself and your own, what you, what you personally think needs to be in the picture. And it, it's a, it's a good way of starting a conversation. Uh, uh, so if you could, I like everything that I'm seeing here. <laughs> I, can you please <laughs> i don't know if <laughs> i i don't know if i could interpret this uh, yeah in the way that it was meant uh, to, <laughs> to be yeah so let me start over here in the upper left hand corner this is a picture of the ice follies from the 1970s um looks like vegas showgirls doesn't it um yeah but um, so my grandparents lived in Philadelphia and every Christmas they used to take us to um, go see the ice follies every Christmas, like day after Christmas, they used to always take us to go see the ice follies, which was this spectacle of a show um, with um, skaters. And I was so mesmerized by the wonder of it all when I was a child, because there were so many elements of surprise and, and excellence in skating because they had the best skaters in the world um, that were skating. There was entertainment. There was, it was a show, right? It was just this experience that everyone in the audience experienced. And i I dreamt uh, about, you know, becoming a skater um, and being a part of that 
wonder. Um, and that was such a formative experience for me that I actually ended up becoming a skater that, um, that, you know, that began a 50 year love affair with skating, but it really, um, it was really the wonder and the magic of it all that was so mesmerizing for me, but that introduced me when I became a skater, it introduced me to, um, the building of a craft. So when you become a skater, you don't step on the ice and take a few lessons and become a skater, right? It's a, it's a journey mm -hmm. um, and a 50 year journey. <laughs> um, so it, it really gave me the, the discipline and the um, really the model for um for practicing something and then um, building a craft, which um, yeah. I think is a huge part of design, a huge part of innovation. But it, that that was really the very formative moment in my life when I learned how to to build a craft. Um, so that was my skating experience. And then here's my my Folgers experience. So in the early nineties, I was, uh, on the brand team for Folgers coffee and Folgers coffee at the time in the early nineties was the coffee brand in America. Not many people remember a pre Starbucks, uh, day, but Folgers really was the coffee brand in, um, in America. And the younger members of our brand team knew that there was something to, um, the Starbucks experience that um, we needed to pay attention to. Starbucks at that time was just a $165 million business in Seattle, uh, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I had gone to coffee houses in college and I thought, you know, we, we, this is a threat to us. Uh, there's something different about this experience that um, we should probably be paying attention to. So we had a hard time getting our executives to pay attention to it. Um, but we did send a, uh, a plane load of executives out to Seattle and they went around to lots of different coffee houses and came back to, C to Cincinnati where we were located and ultimately decided that we were not going to respond um, to Starbucks. And the reason was, is that we made our decisions based on Nielsen syndicated data. Mm -hmm. Nielsen syndicated data is uh, data that measures club store sales, um, grocery store sales, mass merchandisers, and convenience stores. And those were not the distribution channels that Starbucks was being sold through. It was, um, you know, it was coffee houses. So our executives didn't respond. We said, it's, you know, there's, there's no there, there, there's, it's not showing up on our data. And so Starbucks doesn't really exist to us. Um, we had the primary relationships with the farmers in Columbia. Starbucks had to buy picked over beans at the port um, that were already purchased by Folgers or Maxwell house, which was the other big coffee brand. And, um, and, you know, we had great, um, we had great, um, uh, manufacturing facilities. You know, we had everything in place, yeah. we had incredible branding, advertising, but we didn't respond. Um, and, and I ended up leaving Folgers, my husband and I started our own company, but 20 years later, fast forward, right. Um, Starbucks is a, what, a $22 billion business and Folgers is a $2 billion business. You know, they were able to create 10 times the economic impact, um, because they provided a different experience than we yeah. did. You know, they had an inferior bean. They were able to create this third place that people paid a premium for. Um, yeah. we, my executives didn't think that we would you know, that anyone would ever pay $5 for a cup of coffee. Um, and yeah. so the rest is history. Um, that reminds me a lot of, uh, so, I mean, a, a couple of things. I don't want to get in the way of your illustration, but that reminds me of two things, like uh, Rita McGrath's book, Seeing Around Corners, um, mm. where she talks about, you know, the inflection points in the market and being able to see 
uh, being able to read leading indicators rather than lagging indicators is yeah. a key innovation strategy. And the only way to determine what the indicators of the future are is through discovery activities. Yeah. Um, and things like like what you just mentioned, th- like they're re- the data that they're relying on yeah. is a lagging indicator. All yeah. it says, the only thing that that data indicated was that you were doing the right thing months ago. Yep. It doesn't mean you're doing the right thing right now. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. And it and it really, you know, at the time when it happened, I just knew, you know, I just like this gut instinct that we were missing an opportunity, but I yeah. couldn't I I couldn't quantify it. It took me 20 years for all the lights to go off and say, ah, right? If we had been um an organization that valued experimentation yeah my senior executives would have said let's let's experiment let's just not shut it down right let's experiment yeah and there's an, yeah there's another thing there which i think is really important which i think we're going to get to later which is the innovator's journey um and and the kinds of people that kind of go on these journeys i there's a commonality there to what you're saying uh with experience that i've had and what i've seen in other people which is be being somebody who could have been used as an insight, you know, you recognize in yourself that you had the the kernel of something that could have been a just a game changing insight into their business. Yeah. And you knew that if they had had some kind of process to dig into that insight that you had, or, yeah. you, you know, it could have just been a sense, you know, like mm-hmm. there are, there are always people out there who who see something coming and they're like, I think that's going to be huge. And yeah. if the right person had used the right method and gotten that insight out of them and figured out whether it actually meant something significant, then yeah. the crisis would have been averted or the business would have been saved or whatever. So yeah. I think that there's something unique about be- having that experience of being, um, I mean, in the, in complex systems, you use weak signal detection, which is kind of what you're referring to. Yeah, you were, yeah. you were a weak signal detector, yeah. which we all are at yeah. times. Right. Yeah. But we don't have systems in place to, to capitalize on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, uh, it's still, uh, I still wonder, um, what could have, or would have been, you know, last fall I was, um, I was doing a competition, with um students from around the around the globe and i met an executive from maxwell house who was at maxwell house the same time that i was at folgers and i said what were what were you thinking (laughs) were you having the same conversations that we were having and he said absolutely he said we didn't think that anyone would pay five dollars for a cup of coffee and we didn't respond to it either and it yeah. wasn't until they went to an opening for Starbucks on the Champs Elysees in Paris that they realized, wow, we totally missed the boat. Yeah. And then it then and then the train was out of the station, right? There was nothing yeah. that Maxwell House could do either. But it's interesting that they were having the same kinds of conversations. Yeah. That, yeah. But didn't respond. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So I left Folgers and my husband and I um, started our own publishing company. Um, So I've been an entrepreneur for my entire career. Um, And um, we were covering the wide area networking space and very nerdy um, telecommunication space um, Mm in the in the 90s and uh if you remember you know when we were building the the internet in the 90s um there was a crazy amount of investment in telecommunications um and so we covered all that my my husband is an analyst and he did a lot of primary research on all of the the products that were being used to build the internet so we were writing for people who um, we're building the boxes and the equipment that um, provided the structure for the internet. We were writing for the service providers that were building the networks. We were writing for the customers that were using those networks. Um, and then we were writing for the analysts that were investing. 
Um, and so we met a lot of people. We spent our entire day thinking about the whole system. So this is where systems thinking really um, became very alluring um, because we, we had like this bird's eye view to the whole network, right? We could see all the different pieces and we were trying to make sense of, you know, who would connect with who. And we saw so many opportunities that other people couldn't see because they were in their own silo and they were, you know, operationalizing their particular piece of the business and their particular piece of the network. But being a journalist and, and living in curiosity 24 seven, trying to figure out how all these pieces are going to connect together and how we could create value to share all of that, um, was very, um, it was very intoxicating, really. It was it was really fun. And and we met the smartest people in the world. And that's where design as a differentiator really, um, uh, really cemented my understanding of 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 the value of design. Um, because, you know, there were, there were so many companies, you know, Silicon Valley, they invest in 10 companies and hope that 1.7 are going to be successful. So, yeah. So you really understand the value of, of design. You really also understand the value of, um, the social network that it takes to build, um, a successful company because they really invest in, um, the the investors are really investing in the people that are going to help um, realize that technology and help realize that solution. Um, yeah. So, so it was a you know a wonderful time um, when you know the investment in Sun Valley was in that in our particular industry was incredible. So. Yeah. No, I love that idea of investing in people rather than a, a specific strategy because the smart smart investment recognizes that the the strategy is going to probably have to change or, you know, you're going to run into some issue. Uh, and it's really about how you navigate with that kind of like dynamic equilibrium that yeah. that matters most. Yeah. Not, yeah. It was the people. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that, so, you know, all this is percolating, right? My, my mm -hmm. experience at Folgers and my experience in Silicon Valley. And it was, it was around that time that I began to realize just what my husband's grandfather had accomplished. So my husband's grandfather is Leroy Grumman. Um, he founded Grumman Aerospace and he was really able to revolutionize naval aviation with um, a paper, two paper clips and an eraser. Um, and the Navy came to Grandpa during World War II and they said, we need to figure out how to double the number of aircraft on aircraft carriers because we're losing the war in the Pacific and we need to, you know, we need to figure out how to get more planes on ships. Yeah. And, and the, the problem seems simple enough, right? It seemed because all wings, all, you know, all planes had fixed wings at that point. And the, the problem seems simple, right? You just fold them up. Um, but what happens is that the wings lose their stability when you fold them up and they snap. And yeah. so with an eraser and two paper clips, grandpa was able to figure out that the problem was the problem of a pivot. And if you could fold the wing back on the body of the plane, then you could maintain the stability of the wing and you could still develop that um, uh, folding technique that would allow you to store more planes on, on a ship. Um, and it, so it took a long time for me because when, because I married into this family of designers and engineers, but more importantly, I married into this family of people who used an alternative language to communicate mm -hmm. because grandpa and the rest of the Grumman family were not really talkers. I grew up in a fam. my dad's a lawyer. And so he talks for a living mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so that's how my family communicates, right? I, and, I, and that's how I thought all families communicated, right? You mm -hmm. use an 
auditory language to communicate. And marrying into this family of designers, I realized there was an alternative language to communicate. And that was the language of visualization. Because grandpa yeah. was, he was not, um, he was not deaf. He was not mute, but he just didn't talk a lot is what yeah. I, I, I never actually met him myself. He was already, he had already passed by the time uh, he had passed about five years before I, David and I met, but, yeah. um, but the rest of the family was, was, um, we, we just, we're not talkers, yeah. um, and, and use this visual, use this visual language, um, which was so powerful. And, you know, so all the seeds had been planted. And then when you make this realization about visualization, you're like, ah, oh, right. There's an alt there's an alternative way. Yeah. It's, we don't have to try and communicate with words alone. Yeah. So, yeah, so that that was very powerful for me. And and around, you know, so around all this time I'm I'm intrigued by the science of it all, right? Mm -hmm. Like how what neuroscience is uh do we understand or do we know about why our brains make more meaning? Um, and so when my daughter was born, that's this little cute little munchkin. Um, when my daughter was born and the doctors handed me this child, I had this overwhelming sense of, oh my gosh, how do you launch this little thing into the world? <laughs> um, and how do you how do you do that? <laughs> it's like, there's no yeah. there's an operating manual. How do you do that? Yeah. My default, um, uh, like my go to strategy when I have like a, a problem like that, or you know when I'm I'm trying to figure out something is to read. And mm -hmm. so I read a ton of books about um, parenting, which all talk about the neuroscience and the neuroplasticity um yeah right have you do you read a lot of, of neuroscience i'm it's kind of a geek it really oh yeah no i i love it and actually i for me um i think that the i think that study of neuroscience and behavioral science and uh, actually behavioral economics were the things that really opened me up to oh wait there's this whole other system happening that's yeah. you know like it's not just, I, I feel like in many ways, my, my journey into the space mirrors, mirrors your own in a lot of ways. There's that spark of, oh, wait, I'm, I'm, there's value in me and it's not being utilized properly. I am a, I am a weak signal detector. And then there was, <laughs> oh, wait, there's these big systems all around us. And there's yeah. just, if you just apply the right constraints, you can control the system. And then there was, oh, wait, there's this really complex system that's just inside our own brains. And we, you know, the, like the field of behavioral economics. Um, one of my foundational books actually is Thinking Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman is just, Love that. it changed yeah. everything for me. Uh, just this idea that, you know, there are systems happening in our brain that we're not really aware of. And yeah. there are emer emergent processes that we need to, that are being kind of exploited at times and can be taken advantage of and kind of yeah. have to be coaxed in some ways, you know, uh, it, it's not, it's not just a clean, you know, it's not just a simple system that yeah. neuroscience is very yeah. complex. Exactly. But the neuroplasticity of the brain yeah. is so exciting. I think as a, as a parent, like you can help shape your, you know, there, there are intentional things you can do to help shape and develop your child's brain, mm -hmm. um, to help launch them into success. And the, I think one of the most important ones I discovered was about gratitude and how you can, mm -hmm. if you practice gratitude, you can actually, you can actually shape a happy brain, which is, mm -hmm. um, I, which is incredible, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a powerful idea. Yeah. Um, so I read a lot of neuroscience. I still read a lot of neuroscience. Um, and I decided that, at, you know, as a result of reading all that, that I needed to have some daily habits and some daily practices with my daughter to just help her build the inventory of skills that she would need 
to launch into adulthood because I realized well, again, 18 years and then, you know, I needed to be able to, to launch her and then she's on. Yeah. Her, right. So, so over the years we have, um, we have journaled um, mm. and I've discovered the power of self-reflection um, mm. because journaling and reflection is work, right? It's, it's something yeah. you have to do on the, you know, on the regular, um, we keep nine journals, um, every day that, um, just help give my daughter, um, the skills and the, the practices that she needs to become courageous, um, to become curious, um, be thankful to, um, it gives her a place to practice kindness. Um, it gives her Mm -hmm. a place to practice, um, courage you know when when she was in the sixth grade she came home and um they were studying uh ethics in sixth grade sixth grade pretty incredible actually yeah um, they're studying ethics in sixth grade and she said mommy I, it's cool. is, <laughs> I know she said mommy what is courage and i thought well how do how do you yeah. how do you find this and this isn't like um this isn't a one answer um yeah explanation right yeah so so that day we created a courage journal so that she could um she could begin to understand for herself what courage was um Mm -hmm. and what moral courage is um yeah so it has given her a place to practice courage um over all of these years um which is um you know which i wanted to be able to help her do because it's Mm -hmm habits and it's um it's daily practices um and yeah. daily reflection yeah so um yeah so that so that's my girly um she's uh she's 17 now she's a junior in high school um on her way yeah um, so um all right so just two more things um okay. so one for the for I don't know, 14 years, we lived in this beautiful ski resort of Sun Valley, Idaho, which is where I am today. Um, and, um, and living in a rural mountain town really gave me an appreciation for, um, for life outside of the city. I grew up in, I was born in California. I grew up in DC and I had lived in the city most of my um, most of my life. Um, and then I moved to this rural mountain town. Um, and it gave me an appreciation for a cowboy mentality. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it gave me an appreciation for, um, living outside the rules. You know, I think often, um, living in a city can be actually very provincial because they're, there are so many rules of engagement and, um, and when you live in a cowboy town, uh, there, there are no rules. Um, so, so living in a cowboy town gave me, gave me an appreciation, um, that people view the world differently, um, than Washingtonians. Uh, and I mean, my parents had always, had, had always, um, you know, we, we did a lot of traveling as a child, but, um, it, when you're an adult and you learn, um, that people really challenge your assumptions around, um, how the world should operate. And, um, it, it, I think it's help. It was helpful for me to live in a different culture. So I feel like I'm yeah. a resident of two cultures, right? I, I'm a resident of a, a rulemaking culture and I'm a resident of a cowboy culture. And that's yeah. benefit, benefited me to, um, to live in those two worlds and, and appreciate those. Um, yeah, absolutely. And like, I think there's a, I mean, Franz Johansson talked about this in his book, The Medici Effect, about how innovation happens at the, at the intersection of, of things, just yeah. generally anything. Like it's not, you know, like going becoming an expert at one specific subject gives you the capacity for kind of incremental advances. Whereas, uh, it's, it's where it's when one person moves into a different space that they start to have those like explosive fireworks, innovation, you know, like 
game changing ideas um, yeah. is when you start to identify where those two things intersect. And I think that can be at the intersection of cultures, like really. Yeah. yeah that's, that's like a perfect demonstration of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but then we moved back to DC and when I moved back to DC, um, in 2010, um, I was struck by the lack of community. So living in Sun mm. Valley gave me the first experience of my life of living in community, um, yeah. multi-generational community. Um, but living in a small town, people take care of each other and the, the network is a social network, right? If you, if mm -hmm. you do not have a social network in a small town, um, you, you, you don't get anything done. You, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you, you, you can't, um, you can't live outside of the social network, right? Because everything, everyone, this, the community is dependent on each other. And mm -hmm. so when you, and I had never experienced that, right? When you live in a big city, there's so much anonymity of, around being a citizen, you, you can live by yourself yeah. and not interact or engage with society and, and, and function. Yeah. You, cannot, you cannot do that in a small town, right? I Everybody suspect, is dependent yeah. on each other. <laughs> I suspect that's somehow related. And I haven't explored this thought in depth. I'm just sort of uh, riffing on what you just said. Um, I suspect that that's related somewhat to the creation of systems within cities um, yeah. where, uh, and I think, you know, like we said at the beginning of the call, I was saying how, it had started out so, you know, we it, the Zoom calls were random, right? And yeah. then as time grew, we created efficiency creating systems about how we spent our time on Zoom or how we spent our time together, or who we spent our time with so that work could fill up more and more of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what you see in cities is they create systems to foster efficiencies. Um, and what that does is it strips all of the relationality out of everything. Yeah. Um, where it, and that's been my experience as well with small towns is, um, you know, that within small it like I think that moving from a city to a small town, it can be very it can be really difficult because everything has to be done through relationships. Like what <laughs> everything that gets accomplished is because, you know, the person who exactly. whatever. Uh, that's actually something I've noticed about um, about. Uh, innovation systems that people are trying to set up in, you know, in like government and stuff is there's people trying to create efficient systems uh, that are like pipelines and stuff. But the stuff that actually seems to take hold and work are these organic networks of relationships. Yeah. And you know, the like, you know, each other. And, and part of that is you trust each other, right? Yeah. Because the, yeah. that relational aspect is a, yeah. is a key component of that. Yeah. It's beautiful, really. Um, and, and I had never experienced it until I had moved to Sun Valley. You know, I mm -hmm. grew up in the suburbs of DC and, and I lived in a lovely neighborhood and, and, but it was very homogeneous and mm -hmm. everyone, everyone was the same age and, you know, I, it, it wasn't intergenerational. It wasn't, um, there weren't economic disparities mm -hmm. and um and in a small town you've got everything um yeah. and when a member of the community needs support the community responds um, yeah i with that that, like that's an interesting departure from i think a lot of the stereotypes that we get about small towns um mm. which is that you know which i think I think there's room for there to be correctness in both observations of, of yeah. small towns that they can yeah. be very, that they can be uh, ex sort of exclusive to outside mindsets, or maybe um, they, maybe the, their relational quality causes a, a in, in the increase in group think. Um, mm -hmm. Cause one of the things that I'm thinking about it, in relation to that idea is that um Je and Jeffrey West talks about in his book Scale. He talks about how, as the as the population density of a city goes up, its level of innovativeness goes up, 
Mm -hmm. And that's a function of the increase in just collisions, like Mm -hmm. of ideas. And there's this exponential increase just because as you pack more people together into a space, they exponentially increase in the amount of just random things that are, that are colliding together. Right. And that causes an increase in measures of innovativeness, which are in this case, it was like how many patents are being, you know, uh, produced or, or other metrics. But at the same time, I think that there's a counter effect, which is without that relational quality, right. you don't end up having the kinds of conversations that foster the uh, those serendipitous collisions. Like, right. So I think that there's, I think that you can simultaneously have both. Um, yeah. And th- yeah. But that takes intentionality. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And which I th- yeah. Well, and so that brings me to my last image, right? So my last image was, you know, moving back to DC. When I, when I came back home, I, there were so, there were so many people that needed support. There were so many people Mm -hmm. that there's so many communities that were hurting exponentially, you know, more hurt and pain in DC than there was in Sun Valley. Yeah, And I thought, it was so troubling to me. It was so, um, I, I didn't know how was this like a single person, how was I going to like affect change in that yeah. city? And, um, and so summer of design really, um, inspired me. You know, well, the, the notion of equipping people with the skills that they need to make change within their sphere of influence really inspired me to think of a way to, you know, provide a way for yeah. people in our city to make things happen where they thought, because, you know, I could, I could help an organization in DC and, and I, and I could make change within one organization, but there were so many organizations that needed mm-hmm. help. Yeah. And I needed to be able to, to sleep at night and figure out how I was going to affect change in lots of organizations. Um, so by equipping people with the skills of design thinking to um, help them help other people make change really became a vehicle for me to transform my city and, and, yeah. and a way to transform um, it's a long game, right? Like <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of work to do. Um, but I, I already see alumni of summer of design, um, having those, um, explosions of connection and making yeah. things happen. Um, which really, um, is very satisfying to, to see how they're making that change, um, together. So let yeah. me stop this and um oh my goodness i you have you have doomed everybody who's uh, ever going to be a guest <laughs> on this to have to replicate that experiment uh, again because it went so incredibly well i uh, thank you for putting all of the time into that and yeah. i i i love the exercise of just creative visualization of something and yeah. you know it kind of forces you to do some some self reflection on what are the most important things for you to talk yeah. about, um, yeah. uh, so people can get to know uh, what your experience is into this. And also, I think it. Um, I mean, I'm seeing so much of that. Uh, you know, your journey, but like that reflects very much what what I've gone through, and kind of it mirrors what I've tried to do with Agitari, which was. I recognized that these dynamics need to exist. And then I recognized, oh no, there's like this whole relational thing that's super necessary for the sustainment of anything. Yeah. And uh, I've been having these conversations with people who are like, can you come facilitate a thing for our organization? And my first thought is always, if if I were to even get you started on the path, do you have the organizational qualities to sustain or replicate that? And mm-hmm. so maybe a more important conversation to have first is who are we and how do we equip ourselves to be ready for this journey, which is what I've tried to do with Agitari. It's like, let's become something that is all that is self-sustaining before we start trying to do specific things. And, and I think that speaks to 
uh, what, you know, I, so I invited you to talk about the innovator's journey, but then I also asked you to do this exercise and we are <laughs> almost at an hour oh. and it has been, no, it, and then it has been fantastic. I love, I think we've hit on some just incredibly important points, but can we can you just have talk? a conversation too around. I would love to do that because I, I don't yeah. think that 15 minutes is enough time to really um, to cover everything that I wanted to cover with the yeah. innovator's journey. But I would like you to talk a little bit about um, what what you've seen at at uh, Summer of Design and Design Thinking DC that you think are uh, some of the most important and sustaining elements um, and some of the successes that you've seen. Um, because that's a lot of what, what uh, Summer of Design and Design Thinking DC are, it are things that I think we desperately need in the defense space that we're, you know, we need that home. We need that yeah. community to sustain these efforts in the face of, you know, like you said, in the face of just a, a lot of problems, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for me, um, I think one of the most important things for me was to figure out how to provide an invitation for people who wanted to travel on that journey. Um, mm -hmm. I saw, um, I saw design thinking, I saw people practicing design thinking as like a, a quick fix process um, that wasn't leading to the results that they had hoped and then scratch their heads and think, okay, well, this, this design thinking stuff doesn't work. Um, and, and I needed to figure out how to, um, how, how to extend that invitation to to change that their own that person's behaviors and mindsets so mm -hmm. that they could actually experience something with those tools um, so that they could become someone new and then that would allow them to to make that kind of innovative change that they wanted to make right design yeah. thinking is is not like a i don't know it's not like a, a self help kit for innovation or right, right it's it's not a okay, um, yeah yeah i'm gonna <laughs> pivot here back i'm pivoting backwards because we need to talk about the innovator's journey uh <laughs> would, would you be okay with us extending about 15 minutes because i yeah. just remembered that i promised somebody that i was going to share our interview and we were going to touch on the innovator's journey and so i i have a deadline for this conversation and we need to talk about the innovator's <laughs> journey so my <laughs> we're doing we're doing loops it's iterative it's fine uh so you know what at this point i decided to go ahead and split the episode in half because in part two karen and i discuss the innovator's journey for a good 45 minutes i'll be posting part two of this episode at the exact same time thanks for joining us